TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. Uh, we're not live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe. Turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Uh, don't forget, if we do go live and you happen to miss it, this is where you can catch the highlights right behind me. We do got merch. Appreciate everybody who bought some. And we also got a Patreon where we post Monday through Friday. Uh, today is fresh meat. You can catch that link underneath the in the description. Um, just hit more and then click uh, link tree and then all of that stuff will come up. But this is from Vice. The fall of Britain's most hated businessman. I think I heard of him before. But let's get into what Vice be talking about, man. You've not understood. Hang on, go hang away. on, hang on. There's no Just need for any violence. Just go away. We're asking you Listen, questions. I thought it was abhorrent that this bunch of pirates basically were milking it for their own personal gain while the whole thing collapsed around them. Green started ringing out, being very aggressive, effing and blinding, saying, I'll push you through a window, this kind of stuff. And that's where the, the fun and games began. The collapse of BHS wasn't just the loss of 11,000 jobs. It also triggered one of the biggest corporate scandals in recent years. Over the years, Sir Philip had paid himself millions of pounds in dividends from BHS. It didn't help him that he took Ooh, delivery of a We have so many BHS type stores in America, especially like in big cities, Florida, especially in Florida, because Florida, Floridians kind of cheap, even though they look like they rich, they be cheap. A hundred million pounds super yacht during this whole thing, so while pleading that he couldn't afford to pay off the pensions, he was floating around the Med on Lionheart. At the centre of it all, this man, Sir Philip Green. Sky News pursued him and caught him on some dockside somewhere where there's a confrontation. Why are you on holiday when they think that you're supposed greasy. to be sorting out the pension deficit? Will you go away? Why won't you just answer a couple of go questions? Go away. Have you got a... No, just wait, wait, get off. Hey, hey. go in the... I'm Oliver Shah and I'm a journalist at the Sunday Times. That's Bill Nye, man. I became the paper's retail correspondent in about 2013 or 2014. Philip Green was a key player back then. It's easy to forget now, but he owned a huge chunk of the high street with Arcadia, Topshop. Uh, Dorothy Perkins, Miss Selfridge, BHS. You know, most of the chains I own from Burton down have been in the high street for 100 years. They're still here. Philip Green was always a, a fascinating character. He identified quite early on doing... I mean, cheap versions of what people wanted was a good way of making cash. So he became, in some ways, one of the first people to identify fast fashion in the UK with this store called Bond Street Bandit, and which was buying, you know, end-of-line stuff from um, designer brands. At the time, in the 80s, this was quite a new idea, you know, it was um, expensive Super to go and buy now. these big names. So when I arrived as retail correspondent 2013 or 2014, I made my first call to him to introduce myself and um, yeah, dialed his number and he answered straight away. And I said who I was, I'd be covering retail and there was a slight pause and he said, well, you better come and see me, hadn't you? And so I went along to Berners Street where he had Arcadia's HQ. And a um, bit of a rite of passage, went up to see him and um, it was so this guy was like the godfather of knockoff, not even knockoff, like, like end of like Marshalls. Like, you know, y'all got Marshalls out there, or they buy the end of sale, end of season stuff, and they sell it for super cheap. He was like the starter, the godfather of that, the starter. Created you know, lots of shiny black surfaces, a black and white pictures of Philip Green and Kate Moss posing like a, a celebrity couple at events. He was quite avuncular, twinkly-eyed, and uh, we finished the meeting and he said, he held his hand out and he said, right, don't forget your Uncle Philip. And that was my introduction to the world of 
quid pro quo that was dealing with Philip Green. See, Philip Green, you would have met before. From the early days, Philip Green and his wife had this much plug. He met the Queen and everything. Well, now wife Tina showed a liking uh, for celebrity. They understood that blending together celebrity with business was quite a good way of burnishing their own credentials. So Philip Green associated himself with a who's who of big names of the noughties. Kate Moss obviously was his muse at Topshop. It's got to be sexy, it's got to be edgy. You can relate to Kate Moss wearing that. He became uh, a common sight at the front row of catwalk shows, hanging out with Anna Winter. Famously, he attached... Well, there's so many stores like this. There's uh, uh, Char Charlotte LaRousse or whatever. Uh, all Dots, like all of these stores that are similar to this. ...himself to Simon Cowell, the X Factor creator. And he would appear on the red carpet with a whole range of people. Throw parties on the boat, invite people to spend the weekend on the boat. And he was very fond of throwing extravagant parties. So um, PG50, as his 50th birthday was called, he had Tom Jones playing, he had Earth, Wind and Fire, he had Rod Stewart. This was all hosted on a five-star hotel in Cyprus. I've known Philip for a, Sir Philip for a very, very long time. Can he go wrong? No, absolutely not. The less time he spent in the UK, the more time he spent partying in Miami and on the boat. That statement did not age well, apparently. In the med and um, around the world. And uh, he became more distanced from, you know, high street trends in the UK. He was always very unbelieving of the online phenomenon. Famously lived off his Nokia brick phone, never got a smartphone. Um, so really sort of insulated himself from all these uh, changing winds that were starting to reshape the UK. I'm not That's computer, sometimes man. what I'm... you got to do. And like, and when you're trying to make your own lane low key, you got to insulate yourself. Like, like doing reactions. I don't watch really nobody else's reactions because I don't want to, you know, fall into the same, you know what I'm saying, tumbler as them all, you know what I'm saying? But it makes sense business wise. I'm not an internet man myself or email man. I'm a man who likes to see people. Philip Green. Good, let's get Philip Green. Describe the brand in Twitter terms. Give us the hashtag. I don't know about all of that. This is not what I do. I've got a team that do all of that. Um, no, I think we're in pretty good shape. So March 2015, Philip Green suddenly announced the sale of BHS for a pound to a consortium called Retail Acquisitions. And as part of that, this new consortium would take on the 11,000 staff, 20,000 pensioners. The pension fund had huge problems, a big hole in it. And the chain was losing loads of money, so you could see it didn't have a bright future. Straight away, I thought, you know, why on earth would this group of people want to take on this huge load of liabilities? And I looked into who was behind retail acquisitions, and the main character was a, a guy called Dominic Chappelle. The crisis began when Sir Philip sold BHS Dave to Dominic cousin. Chappelle, a man with no retail experience, in 2015 for just one pound. The more I looked into him, the more I could see this was going to be a big story. He had no business credentials, really. He had a string of failed companies behind him. He was a former racing driver, small time. So I started investigating his background. And no lie, he looked like a failure. He looked like a fall guy. That's what that looked like. Like, like a, you, you the goofy that bought it for a dollar and had to put millions of dollars into it and people was going to get mad at it. You that guy. Um, running articles showing oh, yeah. that he was uh, a guy with a very checkered history. The story snowballed from there. I searched on Company's House where you could see someone's background and what they'd done before. And there seemed to be a property scheme on the Isle of Wight. So I just um, very simply got Google Maps up and got the phone directory up and started calling a few local businesses and cafes and asking about who knew it. Someone said at one point, you should speak to this guy. He was the old harbour master. And I got the guy's number, called him, and um, the first thing he said was, Dominic Chappelle, I wouldn't trust him to run anything. Through him, I met a load of other people who'd dealt with Chappelle, and the whole story came out about how he'd borrowed a load of money 
uh, at the peak of the property boom around 2006, 2007. Um, had set out trying to build these luxury flats, but had then squandered a load of money on uh, cars, boats, lifestyle, uh, which turned out to be his modus operandi. So he got to capping. He told, he told people he was going to invest their money, but got to capping. You know what I'm saying? He looked like a slime ball too. All these people look like slime balls. So that first story came out, and that's where my relationship with Philip Green really turned on a sixpence because suddenly he could see we were going to try and expose the fact that he was selling this company and trying to get rid of the liabilities to a guy who was a charlatan. To begin with, the rest of the press didn't really follow our stories, and I, I always thought that would be the case because Green had so many editors on speed dial that he would be frantically dialing around trying to kill it. And so we kept on producing more and more stories about the antics of Dominic Chappelle and these guys who bought the company, how they were doing the same thing again they'd done in the Isle of Wight, you know, spending a load of money on lifestyle, helicopters, boats, cars. This was a company that was losing hundreds of millions of pounds a year, um, had lots of employees on minimum wage. I thought it was abhorrent that this bunch of pirates basically were um, milking it for their own personal gain while the whole thing um, collapsed around them. Former BHS owner Philip Green must now answer questions in Parliament about his management and profit-taking while in charge. At some point in the select committee, he read out a pre-prepared statement, which I found astonishing. Did you know you can increase your revenue with Snapchat ads? Just ask Manscaped. We have seen a... Um, I wrote down something on my pad. I thought I might forget it. So, I'm, I'm you know, whether it's right or wrong, and I've thought about should I, should I not say it, but I'm going to. He said, uh, my doctor has told me that envy and jealousy are incurable diseases. I've done nothing wrong. Well, the big question for... So you're guilty. You're guilty. When people come out and say that right off top, you're guilty. For Philip Green is, will he pay back the profit that he made out of British home stores into the pension fund to help offset some of the deficits so that these 11,000 workers can get more of their pension? No, it, it, he I'm won't. Call the police if you don't Sir Philip, people want to know why you're on holiday when they think that you're... You know he rich. He got on white socks with black shoes. Just not, just never cared. <laughs> Supposed to be sorting out the pension deficit. Will you go away? Why won't you just answer a couple of go questions? Go away. Have you got a message Which for the... Are you not understanding? Hang on, go hang on, away. hang on, There's no just need for any violence. Just go away. We're asking you Listen, questions. That's going to go in the... Eventually, in 2017, after he'd pretty much uh, destroyed his reputation, Let's get he paid uh, almost £400 million to settle the pension scandal, and that um, that drew a line to a degree. Oh, he paid. They must have been on his ASS. They had to be. ...degree under the whole thing. Uh, and things went quiet for a while, but then um, he still had Topshop and Arcadia, and I did suspect it would end up being a similar story again with BHS, as in he'd taken huge dividends out of BHS, huge dividends out of Arcadia, famously £1.2 billion uh, tax-free to his wife Tina in Monaco from Arcadia. And Arcadia finally went under during the COVID pandemic, and that was really the end for Philip Green as any kind of force on the high street. So you know what I'm course. saying? When you're a sleazeball in business, you can get you can get short-term gratification, but in the long haul, it's not going to work because people are going to find you out. There's no way that you could be a sleazeball in business and not get found out. There's too many accountants. There's too many lawyers. There's too many people you're sliming out. Like it's it's not going to work. <laughs> so a few years. I pulled together all my reporting from the Sunday Times and various interviews and research I'd done, uh, and did the book in 2018. And the book really summarised the whole scandal. So the BHS issue, uh, the problems with Arcadia, the lifestyle, the behaviour over the years. He would ring me again and again, and some days he would say, no one's going to read this effing stupid book. And he offered me um, you know, money not to write it. He said, be a sensible fellow. I'll donate the equivalent sum to a charity. You stop writing it and we'll all forget about it, otherwise you'll get sued. Just as the book was coming... You're a good guy, because I would have took that little bit of money. <laughs> you get me? I ain't even gonna hold you. I would have took that money and still wrote the book, slimed him back out, you feel me? Out, um, the Telegraph 
produced a very in-depth investigation detailing how several staff had been paid big settlements and had signed NDAs um, to avoid talking about allegations of um, racial abuse, inappropriate uh, sexual comments. And since then, Green has seen his reputation um, largely destroyed and has um, become something of a recluse and basically, as far as we know, lives in Monaco and um, spends a lot more time on the boat. You know what? My bad, Dale. You are nothing like that, man. You got morals and you would never do that. You from the hood. Um, secondly, this dude's probably still rich. That's tough, man. TLL, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notifications. I'm gone.